Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first pre-IC session. So this one is on building topic knowledge using the RRNR. And here presenting, we have Martha Barlow, who is one of the Wisconsin affiliate directors. So go ahead and take it away, Martha. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us this morning. And um, we are going to talk about lots of different ways that you can use the readings, research, and resources publication from FPSPI. So um, to start with, most of these activities are intended to be done together. So with your students, either in person or online. A few have outside elements where you would assign things to the students. Um, it's really a good idea, and maybe you already have established protocols for breaking your students into pairs or threes or fours. If you know, if you have one team, breaking into pairs frequently can be useful. And if you have more than one team, you can use cross team groups, mix it up, and use you know pairs, threes or fours. It's a good idea to establish ways to record and share the results of the work, especially if you're working online, whiteboards, Google Docs, et cetera. Um, we didn't used to have to worry about that as much, but you know, things have changed. And so we've learned a lot about working online with students. Uh, and you wanna develop ways to determine student participation or non-participation if you're online. So to make sure that everyone is engaged. So the Readings, Research, and Resources publication um, is a must-have. I'm assuming if the, you are taking students to international conference that you're familiar with the publication. Um, of course, at the beginning of the year, it has chapters on all four topics. And then as we approach the international conference, there's a separate chapter um, on the topic for international, which this year is currency. So if you haven't got the currency chapter yet, you should get that right away. Okay, so <clears throat> the RRR on currency includes central themes and major concepts. And for me, that's really helpful to kind of, you know, break the whole uh, topic area into really useful pieces. A topic overview, terms and definitions, questions, activators, summarizes, quiz, open response questions, article summaries with links, digital resource links, and an appendix that has research strategies, problem solving tools, and a practice feature scene. So the practice feature scene can be very useful as well. We'll talk first about using the terms and definitions to build topic vocabulary. <clears throat> so one activity would be to identify some of the key terms. One way to do this is have each pair of students identify 12 to 20, unfamiliar but key terms from the vocabulary list. And then maybe compare lists um, and select 16 to 20 to focus on. There are 30 terms in the current chapter on currency. Um, and so one way thing you can do is to ask students to note or highlight when they encounter these words. But meanwhile, you would be working on developing their understanding of the words. I like to go through and take a look at which words do I think my students would be pretty familiar with. I'm going to say in this topic, what I put in the familiar list may not be familiar to your students, but on most of the lists, there's a whole lot that are sort of um, regular vocabulary that you don't need to really go into a lot, like transaction. Most students may understand what a transaction is. They have maybe heard of Bitcoin, may not understand it. Um, some of these contactless payment is just an easy definition, you know, um, using anything other than cash. Um, currency, exchange rate, gold standard, investment. These might be familiar to your students, especially if they are older. Some of the less familiar um, vocabulary might be things like blockchain, crypto mining, Ethereum. I still have no idea what that is. Fiat currency, ledger technology non-fungible tokens, stable coin. So you definitely wanna make certain that your students understand um, all of the less familiar vocabulary words. <clears throat> so kind of um, keeping in mind this list of 16 to 20 that you wanna focus on. So one activity for understanding these terms. You don't wanna hit all of them if you've, let's say you've identified 20 terms, okay? You don't wanna, work with all of them at one time. 
So divided images sets with three to five words in each um, set so that you can, you know, focus on one set each week that you're preparing is one good way to do it. Um, one, here's an activity that is each week focusing on one set, providing the list of words, three to five words, and said, well, what am I thinking of? Um, and then you would give a definition and the kids could show, you know, a choice with their fingers. Okay, are you thinking of word one, two, three, four, or five? Um, you can also add to your list any new vocabulary that you encounter as you read some of the research articles. An activity um, for using the terms in writing can be kind of fun for the kids. Um, you would provide each student with a list of all the vocabulary terms with or what, without definitions, depending at what point you are as far as uh, working on them, and create a brief scenario like you are doing this or this has happened, um, something you know related to, in this case, the topic of currency, and you are writing or texting with a friend about it. So students write to each other in pairs. So to start with, each student looks at the list of vocabulary and writes one sentence that includes two to three vocabulary terms, okay? Um, and then they will cross out those terms on their list. They will trade the papers or read their sentences to each other um, and also cross out the terms that their partner has used. Um, and so after they each read their first sentences, they're going to reply to their partner in a second sentence using two to three new vocabulary terms. So once the terms have been used, they cross them out and they have to go on to other terms. And you keep repeating this so that kids, you know, get a chance to give, you know, give a try at using all of the vocabulary words. Another activity is to connect those terms to challenges and solutions. So this would be after students are familiar with most of the terms and they've done some additional reading on the topic. Um, you would provide a list of vocabulary terms to each pair of students, and then you would announce a term, okay, via chat if that's online, okay. Um, and each pair would create and record a challenge or a solution using the vocabulary term and based on their research knowledge so far. Or you could do this um, as application to the practice future scene. Then every few minutes, send out another term or announce another term. So a total of four to five terms during the session. You can either share the student's work after each term or after all the terms. Um, if you're online, that might be easier. And look at how the students use the terms. Did they create challenges or did they create solutions? And kind of discuss, discuss those um, ideas that they came up with. Um, one reason this is a good activity is because when the students are writing their booklets, you do want them to try to use the terms in their challenges and solutions to show the research knowledge that they do have. We'll take a look next at the topic overview and the themes. Okay, so um, one thing with the overview is to do some kind of analysis of the summary of the of the topic. Um, <clears throat> it's helpful if you prepare the topic overview and then determine an appropriate graphic organizer, maybe a mind map or a plus minus interesting or a what so what now what Venn diagram cause effect etc. Some kind of graphic organizer that you think fits okay with the topic information. And then determine a way for students to use that organizer. So you'll distribute the topic over not overview, either read it aloud or put students into pairs and have them take turns as they read it aloud. It's good for them to hear it, you know, out loud, not just read it silently um, in this case. And then working in pairs, the students will complete the graphic organizer based on the overview. And once they are done, they can share what they came up with with the large group. Um, and that gives you, uh, you know, a way to discuss the, the overview in a little bit different manner. Another way to use the overview is to do something called graphic representation. So you would distribu distribute the overview so each student has one, okay? You read it aloud or once again, ask students to read it independently or to each other. Then each student would use a large sheet of white paper and colored markers only 
no pens or pencils, to create a representation of the overview that uses pictures and symbols with no more than three words allowed. Then when they're finished, the students share the concepts in their work with a partner or a team or with their parents at home. Okay, this is a good thing to take home and, and uh, have the students share with their parents. Now, one of the nice things about this is that colored markers, um, it, it's kind of been shown that color for kids today, okay, um, activates some, you know, things in their brains and pictures and symbols. A lot of the kids are visual, okay, today. So the pictures and symbols can really help them to retain information better than just looking at words. And of course, when we're researching, we're looking at a lot of words. And so um, taking the time to do graphic representation of the overview or articles um, in the research can help the students to retain that information. This activity is about exploring the themes. Okay, so plan for students to work in groups of two to four students. And if there's more groups than themes, some groups can work on the same theme. There are four themes, okay, in the current C chapter for this year. So you would assign a themes and concepts section to each group. They should take turns reading aloud the information. Sometimes there are graphs and charts, not so much this year, but they, if there are, they should study those. And then they would plan their sharing with the large group. So first they would announce the title of the theme, and then each student, they should plan it out so each student shares a concept or information, okay, for the theme. And then they'll say, we think. Now, this is the important part. So it's not just regurgitating what they read, but doing some thinking about it. We think, and that could either be why it's important, where we should go from here, what needs to be done, et cetera. So the really key thing is for each student to have a we think statement following the basic concept. Um, and if there's more concepts than students, then the students may present a second time taking turns. So <clears throat> you could also consider demonstrating how to share with the we think using ideas not from the themes and concepts, but from another um, topic uh, summary or even a totally different topic so the students get the idea of what you're asking them to do. Now, um, there's lots of article summaries and these are so useful to get started. Um, as far as the article summaries go, with juniors, I focused a lot with um, the RRR article summaries, okay. With high school students who've had, you know, sometimes six to eight years of experience, um, sometimes the article summaries would just be the starting point. We'd cover them pretty quickly and then the students would go on to, you know, more longer articles, even books. But it can be um, a good idea to get a solid grounding in some of the information on the topic using the article summaries. And then when they go on to other reading, they have a um, better base for understanding the more advanced things. You can also adapt these ideas to longer articles, not just the summaries. So um, one minute summaries is that you would create a set of summaries for each group of three to four students. So each um, student would have a different page um, or a different one or two summaries, depending on their age and, and how much time you think you have. Then in each group, each student will read their summaries quietly. They may highlight important information. Okay, it's either a page or individual summaries. You know, um, don't give them so much that it takes more than four to five minutes for them to read. So kind of, you know, adjust that based on how much your students can read in that amount of time. Once they finished reading and highlighting whatever they want, then they either close their documents, they turn their paper over, and they take turns sharing what they learned. Okay, um, if your virtual and students are in breakout rooms, you'll need to alert them when to switch from one person to the next. So you should decide on a time frame. If they've read a full page, the time frame can be one minute. If they've left, 
read less than a page, maybe 30 to 45 seconds. And the challenge to the students is to keep talking about the information that they just read for the full time allotted. So if they've read a full page of, you know, article summaries, maybe there's one long one or a couple shorter ones on the page. If they can um, talk about it for a full minute, that can be very challenging for students in the beginning, but with practice, they get better at that and better at kind of remembering what they read and being ready to share it. Um, so you need to indicate when that time is over, the next student should begin talking. If you're together, you just say move on to the next kid or via chat message. Then um, in a large group, um, you can discuss some of the key issues encountered, encountered, excuse me. Now, if you have multiple teams, each team, you know, four students in a team should each have something different to read. But the four students in another team can be reading the same four sets of things as the first team. So you don't, you know, if you have multiple teams, you don't have to have something separate for every single team, but you do want in a team, each student to be reading something separate. So they're not um, sharing the exact same information uh, with each other, because then one, once one student talks, the rest are like, well, I don't have anything to add to that. So make, making sure that they each are reading something different. Another activity is to do highlighting. Um, you can establish a standard highlight color, okay, for each of these that you could use repeatedly, okay, um, throughout your whole research period, actually. So maybe yellow for facts and figures, pink for challenges, blue for solutions, green for who's, people, experts, organizations. And if you have that, you know, standard kind of set of color, um, you can use it over and over. Then you would break into groups and assign each student one to two pages of summaries or one to two summaries to read and highlight using those four colors. <laughs> um, so once again, you'd want um, each person, each student in the group to be reading something different. Um, or, you know, another way to do it is have them all read the same things and give each student a different color. You know, one student could focus on the facts and figures, another student can focus on looking for challenges, etc. So then you'd return to the large group and discuss what they found for each of those four areas. Um, if you're in person, having a, you know, a big document that you can post in your room, divided into four sections that you can add um, notes to, um, can be helpful that you can continue to add through throughout your preparation period. Okay, another activity that can really lead to improving the students' um, showing of research in their competition work is called research nuggets. So in this case, you would either provide paper or a Google Doc with multiple pages. So you want eight sections per page or post-it notes, okay, or an app um, if you're online. Each student would have different summaries. As they read, you would ask them to record research nuggets, um, important concepts or events or information, one nugget per section, um, one to two nuggets per summary. So um, I apologize that the example here is from last year, but in 2014, 80% of all antibiotics in the US were sold to livestock farms, often used in concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, to prevent infection. Now, you might want to model this for the students, you know, where all of you together read a summary and then you show them how you can pull out a research nugget and put it into um, one of the sections on their papers or on one post-it note. Um, so while they're, you know, let them work for a while and then they'll want, you know, suggest they have one to two nugget nuggets per summary. And after about 10 minutes, then read through the ideas and add one or two category titles, okay, to each nugget. And then if possible, you know, regroup them by category. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that you, um, if possible, you know, the kids can remember a nugget and kind of include it, um, like in a challenge or even in a solution. So using the nuggets with a future scene. Can read and discuss the practice feature scene with the students, break into groups of two or three, assign each group a set of the nuggets. 
or a category or two that includes some of the nuggets or draw the nuggets from a box, however you would like to do that. Um, and then challenge the students to write either a challenge or a solution based on a future scene that includes the nugget information. It might be helpful to have an example or two prepared to show them how, you know, with one nugget to show them how you might write that and incorporate the nugget into the challenge or solution. And once they're finished, then share their work, work with a large group. This is really a key thing. If kids can get practice in doing this, that will help them in writing their booklets so that um, they can think, oh yeah, okay, we, we learned this, okay, whether it was a nugget or not, we learned this in our research and this is related to the challenge or solution that we're thinking about. So we could find a way to um, incorporate that into our writing. You could also, being more creative, use nuggets to create a future scene. So if you have a large number of these nuggets, you can separate and shuffle them and provide each group of three or four, a set of four to six nuggets, ask them to read them aloud to each other, and then challenge the students to create a brief future scene scenario that incorporates those nuggets. The scenario should include a place, one or two characters, and a situation with multiple parts related to the nuggets. Now, you could have the students just do a round robin, talking out loud, you know, kind of creating a, a story as they go around with each person adding on to it, or you could ask them to create a bullet point story, okay? It doesn't have to be long. It does not have to be anywhere near as long as a competition future scene, but just to get them to creatively think about how could these nuggets create that future scene? Um, and then for them to share their work with the large group and um, they can tell it as a story if they like, okay, that could uh, be fun. So this is a creative kind of creative way to, Get them to interact with um, the pieces of the uh, research information. <clears throat> okay, a category jigsaw works if you have multiple teams. <clears throat> so um, for this one, you would identify, let's say, eight categories that are most, you could do four too, but four or eight categories that are most closely related to the current topic from the FPS list, or else if you've generated, you know, categories that just hit the topic, not necessarily from the FPS list, you could use those too. You would assign two of the categories to each team member. Um, first, first give out the four that are most closely related and then the others. So in each team, each student will have two different categories, but then the students would regroup so the students who have the same two categories from one team will join with the students from the other teams who have those categories. And then you provide them a practice future scene or several pages of article summaries or a longer article, um, whatever you want to use. And all the students can be using the, sum, the same one. But each group is going to brainstorm related challenges in their assigned categories only. Okay, um, so maybe they're looking for economics. Um, and so they would look and see what they can find on the economics category. Um, and it might be good if they have two that aren't like so closely related. So you wouldn't want them to have economics and business and commerce. Um, those are pretty closely related. In fact, sometimes hard to tell them apart, but um, so you know, maybe economics and transportation, if that fits, okay, the future scene or the article that you're working with. Then students would return to their original teams and they would take turns sharing their results, what they had um, come up with uh, as far as the article or the future scene you're working with and what they um, came up with in the categories they were working with. Okay, um, another activity you could do with the um, article summaries is to like do a study guide. So you would prepare a document that has room for four to six questions on the top half and then the answers on the bottom half. So creating different sets of two to three pages of article summaries or you know several longer articles, assign a different set 
or a different article to each pair of students. Working together, they would create a study guide that includes questions that address important concepts or information from what they read. On the top half, they would record their questions and then their answers would be in the bottom half, okay? Um, and so once they finished, they would fold their papers in half so only the questions will show on the top. Then you rotate the materials to another pair. So the next pair would read the information, okay, answer the questions, and they don't have to be written. They could be answering them out loud and then check their answers by flipping the paper. Um, so this is kind of a fun way to do a little study guide without um, having it to be like really lengthy worksheets or whatever. Okay, a few additional activities that you could do with other resources, not just the RRR. <clears throat> One is analyzing the who's. So over several weeks of reading and discussing the topic information from a variety of sources, you can of course start with the RRR, but it's good to go on from there. Develop a list of who's that you add to each week with descriptive information if needed. So, and then, you know, keep the list online or keep it on posters in your room. Then after several weeks, you can take that list and sort it, okay, into individuals or expert positions, organizations, stakeholder groups, um, miscellaneous or some other category if one is obvious. Then discussing which who's on your lists most have the power interest or expertise, we call that the PI here in Wisconsin, maybe the rest of you use that as well, to implement improvements in the topic area. So let's say going through your, in, your list of organizations, which organizations would most have the power, interest, or expertise to actually be an implementer of improvements? Um, and then just maybe check off those. And then you could discuss potential actions that the ones you checked might take. Um, this can be helpful because sometimes students, you know, get stuck on, you know, the who's going to really be in charge of a solution or implement that solution. Um, and this can give them a, a wider variety of legitimate who's to choose from. Um, I know when I very first started in FPS more than 30 years ago now, my students would write, have them do this, have them do that, have them do this, okay? It's like, oh, okay, who's going to do that? Um, but even so, sometimes they would leave off who's going to be organizing the solution and just say, you know, what would be, people would be asked to do, but that wouldn't be the organizer. So it's important to get that clear in kids' heads that we need people who actually have the pie. Okay, that makes sense to implement the improvements in the topic area. Another one is to focus on categories, okay? Um, large posters divided into sections and labeled for each category or some sort of online document. And then as you read and discuss topic information over the weeks, you could add ideas to the appropriate categories. So did we read about in this article any, what challenges did we read about? And then just briefly, you know, um, put each of those challenge ideas into one of the categories. Or what solutions, okay, did we read about? And you want to put a C or an S to say, was this a challenge or a solution? I mean, you could also have, <clears throat> do this on post-it notes and then just stick them up onto your um, posters. And as you come across one of these ideas, <clears throat> you could, if you're like discussing something all together, you could assign a student to add it to the group document. Think pair share is another pretty common activity that can be really useful for students. At one or more points during your, during your prep period, um, maybe develop a couple of thought-provoking discussion questions. You can certainly do this near the beginning using the discussion questions that are in the RRR, um, but sometimes as you've moved further into your research, you might come up with two for them to really think about. Then you would group the students in pairs and share one of the questions. Ask them to think quietly about the question for one minute. 
give them the full minute. And then after one minute, ask them to discuss for two or three minutes and then repeat that with the second question. Then group each pair with another pair. Present the questions again, one at a time, and ask the four of them to discuss. With each student, you know, they have a tendency to want to share what they had said, but it's really helpful if they can share what their partner said in the first pair. And that really gives them a chance to listen carefully to what their partner says and what their ideas were. Um, so listening and then repeating and then, you know, talking, thinking, talking, listening, repeating, okay, can really help to um, uh, students' retention of the information that they're learning. Graphic representation of an article is just like that graph graphic representation of the overview. Um, each student would have a different one to one and a half page article. Um, and some this might be good as an outside, especially if they've worked on a graphic rep representation, you know, with you, that this could be done as, as a, an assignment. Um, having them use any size white paper and their colored markers, okay, that really activates some create, creative um, synapses in their brains to create a representation of the article. Once again, pictures, symbols, and a max of three words. Then they would bring their work, or if you're online, they could take a photo of your work, email it to you so you could share it on your screen. And then they would talk about um, what they learned using the symbols and pictures in their um, in their work. So students then couldn't be looking at the article while they're talking, they would be looking only at their work and sharing what they put um, into the graphic representation. Deep reading practice, okay, is really important for kids to learn how to really pay attention to what they're reading. And this can really help with um, when they read the future scene. Um, I had kids come back from college and say that, you know, all the reading and the really pulling out the key information and stuff really helped them in their um, college work. But using a one-page article on the topic, you would give students one to two minutes to skim read it. And then you might ask them what, what stood out to them. Then explain what deep reading is and take 10 to 15 minutes to read the article sentence by sentence using some of the deep reading questions. So you, of course, would not use all these questions on every sentence, but reading, maybe you or a student read aloud one sentence and Maybe you say, do you understand every word in this sentence? Or what's the gist of what's being communicated here? Or does this sentence link to other knowledge that we have? You know, some, you know, a question or two for each sentence. Um, at the end, discuss what did you learn from the deep reading versus just skimming through. And this is, if you practice this with an article, this is a great activity then to repeat with a practice future scene. I think it's important because I can't, you know, if you reevaluate, you're familiar with this, but I read so many booklets where the students say things happened in the future scene that were not there, or they have gotten the information wrong. They didn't look back to check, um, but if they learn to really, really, you know, be, deeply thinking as they read the future scene that can um, really help them to stay on track. Another activity is to interview an expert. Okay. Um, when I was younger and ambitious, of course, I've been retired for a while, so I haven't been working with teams for a while. Um, but for a couple of years, for every topic, I would schedule a field trip for us to go out and talk to an expert. Um, most recently in Wisconsin, we have um, a person on our board who is a professor at the university and he has got uh, recruited experts. And then we've recruited a few students, okay, to be online with the expert and to ask them questions. And 
Um, they speak for, you know, a little bit, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. The students ask questions. We try to keep the whole thing to 30 minutes or less. In the beginning, we made longer ones, but found that if they get too long, then people don't watch them all the way through. Um, but if you're going to be talking to an expert, okay, at a prior meeting, you would describe the expert's background, develop a list of questions, and then possibly assign each question to a student to ask following the expert's presentation, um, and then record the session so that you can share it with other coaches and other students. Um, it's probably best if the number of students, if you're doing this online, which is very convenient these days that everybody is able to set that up instead of having to go sit down with somebody in person. But if you're doing online, it's really probably helpful not to have a huge number. Um, you wouldn't want all, six teams all online at the same time trying to ask questions. Um, but a team of four is perfect, okay, to do a Zoom um, with an expert and then, you know, record that so that you can share that with other teams in your state or even send it to April so they can share it more widely. Um, if your topic has like areas of controversy, a debate can be a fun thing to do. <laughs> you would start by determining a, a debate question. You know, assign half the students to research and identify arguments for the pro side of the question and the other half for the con side. So for instance, with currency, maybe one half is saying, we need to go completely cashless, no con you know, contactless payments, no coins, you know, no actual cash. And the other side would be, no, no, we need to, we need to keep the cash and coins thing going. Um, you can ask some students to volunteer as facilitators and put students into groups of three, one pro, one con, one facilitator. Then the facilitator calls on the students to make 30 to 45 second statements going back and forth. Um, they can either argue against what the other side, other person said, or they can add further statements to their own arguments. Um, an alternative would be just to put the students in pairs with one pro and one con. And then <laughs> that could either practice um, doing the debate out loud, you could have a 30 second timer and say switch or whatever, or you could provide them a Venn diagram, put their areas of agreement in the center and their disagreements on the side, and then they would have something um, in writing that they could share with the rest of the group. If you have time, and sometimes you're very short on time, okay, but if you do have time, some kids really um, respond well to doing creative responses to topic information. And I'm not going to go through each of this, these, but um, here's, you know, quite a list um, that um, you could have them work on while during the research phase near the end or whatever. Uh, they could share their work prior to writing their booklets, or you can adapt it to sharing the UP and Best Solution Action Plan as practice, you know, creating a collage of the information with text and images composing a rap song with key information, um, developing a humorous recipe to show what could be done, um, writing an advice column. So there are lots of things here. And some of these you could really do in a short, you know, 10 to 15 minute time frame, um, just to get kids looking at things in a different way and activating their, their creative minds. So that's what I have to share today. Um, best wishes on studying uh, the topics now, currency for the international conference or any of the topics in the future. Um, I will say as a coach, I learned <clears throat> so much about the world <laughs> working on these topics with the students because often I'd say, oh, okay, here's a new topic. I know nothing about it. And I got, so I really enjoyed learning all this new information along with the students. And then lo and behold, pretty soon you just saw that topic cropping up in the news everywhere, it seemed like. So best wishes to all of you on your work with your students. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Martha, for all of these fabulous activities that we can use the rr and r for. And once again, we will be posting this recording online so you can see all of these slides once again. So thank you okay. for coming, everyone.
Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.